Welcome to Renegade Thinkers Unite, featuring the sharpest minds in marketing, inspirational case histories, and weekly insights you can apply to your business. Download it over 150 times. Find out why top CMOs rank this podcast among their favorites. Now, here's your host, Chief Marketing Renegade, Drew Neiser. We spent a lot of time on this show talking about customer acquisition, and that shouldn't be that surprising because something like 88% of marketing dollars go to customer acquisition. Now, arguably, that may be the right amount of money going to it. It may be way too much. And I thought about some of the episodes that we've done lately. We had Brent Adamson, who talked a lot about reorienting your thinking, not saying you have a sales problem, but you have a your your buyers actually have a problem. We had Janine Pelosi who said, let's build broad-based awareness to drive uh, new customers to Zoom. We had John Miller and Peter Isaacson, both of whom talked about ABM. So we really covered a lot on customer acquisition. What I realize is we haven't spent any time on this show, at least in the last 20 or 30 episodes, on loyalty. So we're going to fix that, at least uh, in today's episode. We're going to re- re- redress that imbalance, or at least try, uh, to make the case for spending more on loyalty. To help with that, my guest today is Danny Cushion, the CMO of Cartalytics, a company that runs cashback loyalty programs for more than uh, a 1,000 bank partners. So, Danny, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Happy to be here today. So... Let's start with the Renegade Rapid Fire. You mentioned before we started that you've listened to a couple of the shows, so you know how this works. We're going to cover as much as we can in eight minutes or so. So what is your definition of marketing? Marketing for me is about driving demand for a company across any audience that they need to address. So from my perspective, we're reaching marketers, we're reaching banks, we're reaching investors, we're reaching what we call affectionately cardlicians, so the people who work in the company. Um, but really marketing, I think, is responsible for making sure that a really clear point of view on what the company is and what it offers to somebody is enunciated. And then it actually really hooks the person that you want to try to get to do something. So um, I boil this down, by the way, uh, to rethink your drink. That's all marketing is. It's just to re- get someone to rethink your drink. Now, I notice that loyalty didn't actually come up into your definition of marketing. Do we need to redress that? Um, maybe. <laughs> it's baked in there, Drew. <laughs> it's baked in. Okay. So what's the primary role of the CMO? I think from a CMO's perspective, at least from my perspective, it's really trying to connect the dots and being able to tell the story of what the company does and really try to boil down um, what do you do for someone else to get them to take an action. I, I think the CMO plays a really important role sitting amongst a bunch of other functions. And I've heard in a bunch of your other, um, a bunch of your other programs as well, connectivity is so important. And I completely subscribe to that. I think if you're not inquisitive as a CMO, if you're not building bridges, if you're not trying to understand the whole part of the business and what challenges people face, you're probably not, you know, you're not being as impactful as you could. I think the CMO sitting in the middle makes a a really big difference in helping to tell the story. Okay. So what's your top priority right now as the CMO? Yeah, at the company right now, we're um we're a pretty interesting company. We're a newly pri- or newly public company. Uh, we we're just the first tech IPO of the year, so we're thank you. We actually uh, managed to get out in the biggest market drop in history in February. So there are a bunch of companies that did not get out that week. So that was uh, always a fun ride. Um, but from our perspective now, we work we do work with as you mentioned about two thousand banks, Bank of America, Region, SunTrust, Lloyd's. Um, but we've also just signed a, a bunch of new banks in both Chase and Wells, which are two of the biggest um, banks in the country. So we're yet, there are a couple people have, so we're actively working on bringing them online. But so now that we've got a pretty good consolidation of all the banks in the U.S., my focus has shifted in a pretty big way. Um, not that it wasn't there before, but really a, a pretty good share of voice for us is about driving revenue and helping make sure there are enough marketers coming into the channel to be able to reach all of the bank customers that we're going to have. I mean, we're going to re- be reaching over a hundred million people, you know, in the next year or so. So it's a pretty good media channel that we've built and it's effective. There are no bots in there. It's reaching real people when they're thinking about their money. We've paid out over $200 million in cash back to consumers. So. It's really now about making sure that brands understand 
um, the impact of, you know, get in there, buy with us, reach people when they're thinking about their money. So we're going to circle back to that because I'm really interested in, in the business model here. Cause, um, but let's, what's your favorite part of the job? Oh gosh. I love learning something new every day. I love being able to build a team and build a function and empower people to learn and do something new that they love, whether that's on my team or not. I do. I really love the people aspect of it. I love being able to tell a story and I love being able to tell, help others um, really embrace their passion and do what they love to do every day. Very cool. So what, um, what don't you like about the job? I don't like, I don't like politics. Um, I don't like, as a natural communicator, I run communications too. So as a natural communicator, I get frustrated sometimes, but I have to dial back the, the angst when there's not over communication within an organization. So, you know, that gets a little frustrating sometimes. Um, I think always trying to figure out how to prove out what you're doing can be challenging when you sort of, you know, instinctually it's that, it's that balance between the art and the science. I think that, you know, I struggle with sometimes as well as I know a lot of our CMO, CMO partners do too, trying to find the balance of, okay, I know this is working, but man, I got to really show it to be able to justify the budget to do it. Yeah, I was reviewing uh, Christine Mormon's uh, study that she does down at Fuqua, Duke School of, of Business, uh, and and they do a CMO study. And at latest count, maybe 40% of CMOs are confident that they can point to their spend and say this is working. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. It's funny. I, I sort of wear two different hats as a CMO as well. So I'm a B2B CMO. Uh, which personally, I love that space. I had been in the B2C side for a long time as well. And once I shifted over, it's, it's a lot more about storytelling and thought leadership. Um, and so I love that side of it, but I work with B2C CMOs and it is, it is hard. There's so much stuff out there to be able to try to gauge how are you doing? Some are proxies, some is real, some it's not. How do you sift through all of that to really know that the levers that you're pulling are working? It's not easy. It's a huge challenge. It, it, it is. I feel like I need to do another show just on, uh, on analytics. There's enough there. There is a lot, maybe 10 shows. Okay. So let's talk about what do you, is there a moment, a renegade moment in your career that you go, this is like on my greatest hits? Yeah. I think from a renegade, it's, I think growing up, I was not a huge risk taker. I think I like to make sure something's going to work before I try it. And I think I've grown through that as I've gotten a little older. <laughs> you sort of realize it's actually okay to try things and test things. Honestly, I think the biggest renegade moment of my career was moving my family. Um, you know, my husband and I moved our family with three kids, a bunch of dogs, cats down to Atlanta three years ago to take the CMO role at Cardlytics. Um, it's a company that I hadn't heard of before it sort of came across my desk. But as I figured out what it was, it was a, oh, wow. I really tried not to swear. I lie. Uh, it was a, it was an oh shit moment where it was like, holy crow, this company does what? Um, but it was a big leap of faith for us to say, okay, we didn't know anybody in Atlanta. Not really. We have some friends down there. It was a pretty big move. We'd always been in the Northeast. My husband's English. So we like to be close to Europe if we can. And, um, it was a little bit of a leap of faith for us. And we just, we got to a, let's just roll the dice. I think we really believe in this. I really believed in the co-founders and the team. And so it was, that was a big scary moment in my career to say, okay, I'm going to put myself out there. And we as a family are just going to try something. And three years later, yeah. And you put I've, your I've hands. I've not regretted it a single day. It's amazing. You put your hands in, uh, in basically your travel life in Delta's hands. I That's think. Really I had to switch. I had to switch over. Yeah. I did. I was a big Southwest girl, but yeah, yeah. Delta's great too. It's Atlanta's a, Atlanta's a good hub. Okay. All right. So, um, is there, uh, a book that you've read, uh, that made you rethink something? Yeah, you know the kind of the kind of books that I like to read. I love historical fiction, right? So like Leon Uris and Rutherford, and I'm actually I actually do audiobooks a lot because when I'm in the car, it's just easier. And with little kids, I don't have I'm not picking up the paper books as much as I used to. Um, but I'm actually listening right now, and I've probably listened to this three or four times. But I just love it. Um, Michener's Chesapeake, and so we lived in Annapolis, Maryland for ten years. All my kids were born there, and he just it's just a really amazing area. And so listening to, to Chesapeake again right now, it's a really great look at the history of how people came through in that region. And there's always something you can find from historical fiction, truly. Like we're, 
right now trying to reframe our diversity and inclusion efforts at Carlytics. And we're a really good inclusive culture already, but we can be better. Like there's more we can do. And actually just looking at some of the stories coming through Michener's Chesapeake, it was written by, a, you know, written by an old white guy, but the stories of, um, you know, people of color, people of different back backgrounds trying to find their way through challenging times. It's, um, it's so funny. So, um, I read, uh, I actually listened to Michener's Alaska and, the, the funniest thing was I knew more of the history than, of course, anybody <laughs> the else guys. on uh, the trip. And I said, are you sure that's right? Because wasn't this it? And, <laughs> oh, I'm uh, sure they loved you. <laughs> yeah, no, they they did. Yeah, who's the wise? You want to step up here, uh, sir? Yeah, yeah, who's the wise ass there? But uh, he's amazing. Uh, and I, I, I'm totally – I'd much rather read historical fiction uh, than just about any other genre. I'm actually right now in this crazy series uh, that's uh, – 1300s um, in France, England, and it's Fun. it's amazing. I love that oh my period. God, it's such a wonderful adventure, and really escapism. So, all right, I can't say that I've necessarily. Although I, I will tell you this, um, the leader in this book is a great leader, and all the characters that he sleeps with his men, he has a way of expressing himself that allows uh, the folks to sort of get behind him. And there is no question, this guy is a leader, and you could sort of write down all the characters characteristics of leadership and and you would find them in this individual and so any leader would benefit from that okay. i'll try that one next all right so will machines ever be able to do your job on their own no okay. is my easy the quick answer i think um they can make it easier they can make it better uh, i actually had the the privilege of getting to see gary kasparov speak earlier this year who's a really amazing amazing person and he actually spoke about how to not think about machine learning and analytics and machines coming through as a replacement for people, but a compliment. And it was a really cool way to frame it, actually, because I still think there's a humanness and a nature and a setting of a strategy that needs to happen from a human mind. But man, machines can absolutely do the things that will allow us to spend more time on that, right? And, and we work with a very data, heavy data company. Um, I mean, we process, we see like $1.5 trillion in spend per year. So there's a ton of purchase data flowing through our pipes at the company. So we love our data. We love analysts and being able to pull stuff through. And so there are things that machines and algorithms and machine learning can absolutely help unpack and find for like trend wise that humans just can't. But from a marketing perspective, I still think there's, there is, I totally subscribe to the art plus science aspect of marketing. Yeah. And uh, at least so far, the robots haven't been very good at that, um, but uh, th they'll get better. Um, one interesting aspect, I totally agree. And, and the most interesting areas to me in robotics are not the robots that are replacing, but the robots that are enhancing, mm -hmm. uh, where you can suddenly wear some equipment around you and lift something and not hurt yourself. So changing the way factory work might, uh, uh, and so there's, all sorts of interesting things or with surgery, um, where, uh, you know, the surgeon's still in control, but the instrument is actually, uh, yeah, a robot. it reduces the error, right? Yeah. It reduces so, the error, right? Uh, so anyway, that's an exciting time. So we will all be working with machines very soon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. One last thing. Was there any advice that you were given that was like, just, oh man, uh, I really want to share this? Yeah. I, I got two actually. Um, one is more, well, both are, maybe are, both are a little bit more personal, but one in life, one is a, just in career wise. So coming out of college, um, I went to a school that had a pretty heavy finance focus and got a lot of finance jobs floating across the, across the desk. And just speaking with my boyfriend at the time, now husband and my, my parents, it was really a, you've just got to follow your gut. I'm a big quote person, but I think one of my favorite quotes is, at every crossroad, follow your dreams. It is courageous to let your heart lead the way. That's tough to do. That's tough to do when you're making a trade-off between coming out and making, you know, near six figures out of school and coming out and making 30 grand to go into sports marketing. But I tell you what, if you choose the path that where your passion lies, it sounds very cliche, but I, it, I subscribe to it. It's if you choose the path where your passion lies, you'll put more time in it. You'll find your way and you will end up doing something that is worth it in life for you. Um, and then the other piece of advice that I got from a woman I worked for at XM Radio was very good. It was in every career, there are ebbs and flows as well. And so you're our, while you might not always be exactly on the high part of the wave, 
Um, just know that it'll, it comes back around. You just keep your nose straight. The cream rises to the top and just keep doing what you're doing. All right. Well, there's, um, those are two good pieces of advice. We're going to ebb and flow into a break. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about, um, loyalty and, and how you can go about building it. So stay with us. You've been listening to another great interview on Renegade Thinkers Unite with Drew Neiser. But the value doesn't end there. As a listener, you can download a free ebook from Drew, Renegade Thinkers, interviews with 11 trailblazing CMOs any business can learn from, top marketing thought leaders and proven executives from Time Warner, American Express, and Chico's, and others. Get your free copy at renegadethinkersunite.com slash ebook. For listeners only at renegadethinkersunite.com slash ebook. Okay, we're back, and my guest is Danny Cushion of Cartalytics, uh, and we're going to talk about loyalty and the importance of it. First, let's just talk about, as a, as a CMO, how do you put loyalty into your marketing plan? I think I'll, I'll hit that from the side of the kind of brands that we work with. Um, since we do, I have the the benefit and the, the fun, actually, of being able to work with um, CMOs across all kinds of different verticals. That's one of the things I love about being a B2B marketer. You can just really learn a whole lot about different types of businesses. Um, I think the way that a lot of CMOs are thinking about loyalty right now, it's getting smarter and smarter as there's more data. I think where, where I see people getting tripped up is when they're defining loyalty on too narrow a view of what their customers are doing. And I mean, from our perspective, we see purchase data. So, you know, if you think about a, um, a brand who has, uh, amazing, amazing CRM system and it's, it's really important. It's important to know your customer. It's important to get them and try to make sure that you're providing them something that they want. You don't need to shill them something like you actually really need to understand them. But a lot of CMOs only know when their customers are shopping with them. Right. And we, I mean, this is where we sort of work with our clients is you can actually, you've got to take a more macro whole wallet view of what else are they doing when they're not shopping with you? Where else are they going? And so I'll give you an example. There's a client of ours who a few years ago, um, Advanced Auto Parts was working with us and they, they only wanted to drive new, right? They, how they had actually defined their loyal customer base was, okay, we know the aftermarket, you know, DIY auto folks who are coming in and spending with us four times a year, we've got them. We've got them. We don't need to put anything against them. We know that we have everything we can out of those guys. So let's not touch them. Let's not reach them. And so we did a little, because just we just love our data. So we did a little analysis and looked at where else are those people buying. And it turned out they were just actually really heavy category shoppers. These people loved their cars. They loved fixing their cars. And they were spending like 60% at competitors, not with advanced auto. So uh -oh. yeah, so it actually, and this is, this is great. Like the best clients now, they step up and say, like, okay, well, how do I reframe that? They had a ton of headroom that they hadn't been realizing. And so they actually opened up their whole media plan and ended up targeting these folks because there was really significant headroom for them. And they dro drove an in a few months, $6 million in incremental sales. Simply by going back to their existing customer base and serving up uh, sort of ideas or sort of say teases something to get them. How do they get those customers back into, uh, to their website to, or to their store to buy? Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, from our perspective, they, I mean, they come through our channel. So we, while we run, you know, media through banks, um, we're reaching people when they're actually thinking about their money. So we were, you know, reaching people because we could segment very quickly and easily based on their past purchase history. But they did do other things as well on their own site with house ads and making sure they're thinking about promotions and how do you actually through all available channels that they had, whether it was a paid channel like ours, whether it was their own channels like email and things like that, just being able to, I think that the key point of this is it was really important for them to pull up in their view of how they were actually defining their loyals, that is the first place to start, right? Before you even get into the tactics of what you're going to do with it, you've got to, you've got to know as much as you can about, no kidding, where is their headroom? So, and just to um, put a fine point on that. So this is a case where a, B, a B2C marketer was saying, all right, we, you know, our good customers buy four times a year when in fact they could probably buy 12 times a year. And they just had no recognition of the purchase frequency because they had no insight into their overall purchase behavior. 
So how did you get insight into the these folks overall and uh, customer behavior? Yeah, so what we as a company do, since we run these loyalty programs for banks, um, we end up, we have the bank's purchase data. And so I say that and with, with the um, gravity and the privacy in mind that needs to come with it, we never see PII. It's always aggregated, anonymized, right? Banks don't just give out their purchase data, right? So... It, the way that we're actually able to run these loyalty programs for banks is we have the ag- this aggregation of purchase data across the board. So we can see – right now we see about one out of five swipes in the U.S., so credit, debit. We also see ACH and bill pay. Once we launch um, Chase and Wells, that number will increase. You can imagine the size of those banks. So we have a pretty pretty cool – I mean this is where we geek out on the data, but we have a pretty amazing massive aggregation of purchase data – because it actually allows us to serve more relevant ads to bank customers, right? And so the banks love this because it's giving something of relevance and a way to save cash and earn cash back on brands that their customers love. It makes their own program more sticky. It increases card spend. It decreases attrition. But from a marketer's perspective, the way that we work is we can help marketers understand, no kidding, where there's headroom. But then we can actually make it actionable, just knowing the information. Like we help them reach those customers through our channel. So, you know, with every, with, with all the purchase data that we do have, um, it comes with great responsibility and we do not do that lightly. We, every bank we work with, we go through very long and brutal LRC, which is legal risk and compliance, um, processes. But that's important because the customer's data is, really important to protect and and make sure that they are, you know, with GDPR and other things coming through, really, really aware of how is their data being used to give them value? Do they agree with it? So just at the at the core of this engine that you've created, and just so the folks understand, so a bank app on the phone. So my bank is First Republic, don't hack me. Um, and I go on there. And in theory, there would be ads on yeah. that app. Yeah. So if you think about it from a, so Bank of America is one of our biggest banks. Um, I'm a Bank of America customer. If I open up my, either my online banking online, um, or I get emails from them, or if I open up my Bank of America app, you'll see right on their homepage, there's a little something called Bank America Deals. And so we white label it for them. Every every bank has their own brand because it's the bank's program for their customers, right? So it will show a number of different ads and offers that you have. You might see a Starbucks or a Whole Foods or an Under Armour or a Hilton. And once you actually click on that ad, the next time I go to that place and swipe my card because I've stayed at a Hilton – that money is um, like a cash back reward is automatically put back into my account because you saw because you clicked on the ad. Oh, so the and the and people who are using this app know yes. that that's part of the deal. Right. If you engage with that's the ad, that's part of it. Yep. If you engage with the ad, um, then you go and swipe your card and you get money automatically put back. So it's super seamless. And the reason that clicking on it is important, not just seeing it, is because from a marketer's perspective, you need to know. Um, what is truly incremental? You need to know that, you know, what if somebody never saw the ad? You know, you're not just going to pay out for somebody who happened to stay at Hilton. There is a natural walk-in rate in every store. So how do you actually do a test versus control where you can hold out? Um, uh, these people clicked on the ad. People exactly like these people did not click on the ad and we can measure true incrementality. Um, if you don't have that, then it's not really fair to the marketer to be able to get to they're, what they know that what they're paying for is truly driven by the media that we've run. They wouldn't have been going in there anyway. So thinking about that, this little tiny media, this little space, particularly in a mobile ad, it's so difficult to work with. But, um, has there been something that, uh, you know, somebody did that was incredibly creative that really surprised you that it works so well. Yeah. You know, what's funny is it ain't, it ain't sexy, right? It's not like these are, these are little logos. And I will say, you know, as a channel and as a company, we will continue to evolve with our bank partners, but it's, you know, banks, that's a tiny little space. And it's, it's, I think where we're seeing creativity and the folks that are, um, doing very well and very smart about it's not in the creative application itself. It's not in the how do I make this logo wiggle or what's the copy say? It's actually more about 
creativity in the targeting. So creativity and thinking about how do I actually cut who I want to reach um, based on their past purchase history. So it's more creativity behind the scenes that the customer will never see. So if I'm, um, say I'm Starbucks, right? They're a very big customer of ours. And if they want to think about how do I address, how do I make sure that I'm reaching customers who maybe used to come to me once a week and don't anymore? Or who, um, who come on the weekdays, but not on the weekends. And it's actually more using the data and analytics behind the scenes to segment appropriately. That's really where the creative creativity comes in for us. Um, will we ever see a video interstitial on a, on a mobile app for a bank? Maybe, maybe. I don't know. So if the creativity is with the data and then seems to me that like there could just be a bunch of, you know, machine learning and algorithms to sort of just keep slicing and dicing the data different ways and just keep testing. Because in theory, you could be testing in real time all the time. I mean, and, and so, so, you know, uh, my question would, there's no creativity because I'm putting a logo in there. The creativity is in the data. Um, Okay, we'll just let that go. Let's just let that sink in for a moment. The creativity is in how you use the data. And we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we'll try to sort that out. Hey, it's Drew. I was at a conference the other day and somebody looked at my saw lapel pen and said, what's up with that? And I said, well, what's the one thing that marketing has always had to do? Forget digital, forget all this stuff. What is the one marketing imperative? And uh, he looked at me and went... Cut through. And I went, yes, ding, 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 ding. That's right. Cut through. That is what marketing must do. And it's not just cutting through the clutter, although that's really important because if your marketing doesn't cut through the clutter, it's like the proverbial tree in the forest that falls and nobody hears it. But it's also cutting through the crap and the processes that inhibit innovation. We've been working a lot lately with some CMOs to help them cut through the crap and get at the essence of what is their big idea and how can they make a case to expand that idea across their business. That, to me, is cutting through. Okay, we're back. And now my guest is Danny Cushion, who is the CMO of Cartalytics. And we've been talking a lot about mobile marketing and how you can take advantage of data. And, uh, you know, immediately the creative in me says, this is the death of idea. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me why this isn't the death of idea. Yeah, I think... Listen, this is our channel is not meant to replace other beautiful creative that occurs on TV and that build builds brand love. And I actually just moderated a panel at Adweek yesterday with um, some great people from Orange Theory and Under Armour and Hilton. And every bit of marketing has its place in what you're trying to get customers to do, right? Our channel is very, very good at driving incrementality, driving sales, being able to connect what is happening in a digital ad to in-store sales where 90% of purchases are still happening in a store. As much as online has grown and will continue to grow, it is still largely in store. Um, so every marketing has its place. We never would ever say to our clients that what we're doing should replace building brand affinity and making sure that people understand the value prop and really get and love your brand, but every marketing has its, has its place and you've got to drive sales. So this is, you know, this is falls into the direct marketing bucket. Um, one would argue. So where are you taking dollars from? Is it coming out of Google spend? Is it coming out of programmatic? Where's the, where's the dollars coming from? Cause it, you know, it's not like budgets have gone up 50%. Yep. So it's got to come out of somewhere. Yeah. It's coming from all those. I think, um, as you've seen a shift to, more measurable media. I mean, we have the ability to be able to show that campaigns are actually driving sales. So it's, we're, we're pulling from other places that cannot show that, that cannot show the ROI. It gets a little bit back to the question we mentioned earlier of like, okay, it's actually hard. It's really hard to measure. We make CMOs lives easier because they know that this media is working. So it is pulling from low funnel things. I would think like SEM, like Google, like other digital display. Like exactly. Well, and that I think is for a different reason, which I'll get into for a second. 
I think, you know, things like mailers, there's still a lot of companies doing physical mailers, which is A, not great for the environment, B, super costly and tough to measure. So there are, we're pulling from budgets like that. But I think, you know, the other thing, I think where we're actually gaining some real traction, whether we're actually pulling from Facebook or others, there's just, there's a there's a mistrust in marketing right now too. What was P, PwC put out a study last year that was like 6.5 billion billion with a B dollars were anticipated to be wasted on digital ad fraud. I mean, man, 6.5 billion dollars. It's a lot. So I think where we're actually getting traction is it actually, it, while it can be a little slow and painful to work with banks, they're, they're regulated to know who their customers are. Bots do not have bank accounts. They don't. They are real people. And so I think we're actually starting to gain traction because you need to know as a marketer that you're not throwing impressions at some stupid machine that is never going to buy anything. Bots don't have bank accounts. There you go. That's the quote of the show, folks. Um, interesting as I'm thinking about that and, and, you know, it's sort of, I, I remember his conversation with a CFO once and he saw some, uh, dollars were coming in through uh, Google ads and so, well, why not spend all the money on Google ads? And, and the truth is you, you can't. Uh, because it reaches a point where it's no longer cost effective. And, and I would imagine this would be a really interesting. Do you have any marketers that are testing sort of a combination where they're doing this down here, as you called it, lower funnel, but they're doing this up here because somehow or other they need to be aware. They need to be dis, in, you know, I don't want to use the term disruptive, but they need some moment where they, something happened to cause them to rethink their drink to be open to yeah. something, right? Um, Every they, marketer. Right. Every marketer we work with does that. We're part of their overall marketing and media mix. Um, we're not the only thing that companies are doing and they sh we shouldn't be. But so what, what's difficult for the other, so some, they might have a TV buy, which is very difficult to measure. And then they have your buy, which is very easy to measure. And it's like, well, your buy looks great and the TV looks terrible. But the truth is if the TV stopped, you're probably your performance would drop. Have you had any tests like that that showed that, that proved it? We haven't actually. And that's an interesting thing to come. I'll bring that one back, Drew. I think, you know, we're not a multimedia attribution company. Um, we are, that's not what we do. Um, uh, you know, our brands, the, our clients that, that we work with do have their own models that put a ton of data points to try to sort that out. I mean, that's sort of one of the big challenges that marketers do face today is getting away from this stupid less click attribution, excuse me, <clears throat> getting away from something that is just very one dimensional. And there, there is a path to success and what is the right path of all of these different media and marketing touch points to get to somebody to convert. Um, I still think we're sort of early in being able to, f for brands to figure out how to do that. Some are getting it more right than others. There's just a lot of infrastructure and process that has to go into being able to plunk something into a model. And it's all based on some assumptions too that, you know, it's, it's not perfect yet. No, well, all research is based on assumptions, yeah. no matter who's doing it. Okay. Let's get back to loyalty. Are you doing anything for your customers to build loyalty? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll put my other hat on. Um, we do. We're actually, we're pretty surgical in our approach as far as from a marketing perspective. You know, we spend a lot of time with our clients just to listen to them. Truly, like just to listen to them and understand what's driving their business. Where are they getting stuck? I think from a loyalty perspective, you know, we obviously, run programs, deliver, run programs, deliver. And truly the proof is in the pudding. And that's true whether you're a, whether you're an Under Armour creating amazing gear and you have a consistent product and, and whoever's buying that gets the same thing every time and they love it. We're building our own brand love by just doing what we do very well and reaching people and driving incremental sales. So a lot of it is my job's easy. It's easy to be a CMO when you, when the company is, is you have a legit product. When the product delivers, mm -hmm. it's easier. Yeah. And in, in this case, it's a very rational, you spend this amount of money, we'll track it all the way through, you'll see the cash register ring. In some ways, an easy yeah. sell. Yet, 
There are other companies that do the same thing. So where do you get use marketing and loyalty to sort of raise the likelihood that if all things were equal, I could spend a dollar on Google or I could expend a dollar on, on Cartalytics? How do you sort of win uh, on the emotional? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm a big fan of using thought leadership and and we actually, we use our data to tell a lot of stories, right? And if you think about the kind of stuff that we do, um, we have a lot of this stuff on our website, but a lot of it we actually use to try to make our clients smarter and win. So we're able to see, since we're able to see purchase data across the board, we can use that to be able to help our clients um, gain stickiness in their own companies too. So if you think about it, um, a number of our clients actually use our analytics and what we see and how they sit in the market in their board packs every quarter. That's pretty sticky. If you can actually help them understand their own business better in the macro environment they work in. Now, do they have to buy media to be able to get that? Yep, they sure do. Because the reason we get the purchase data is because the banks want their customers to get a reward. And so it's sort of a virtuous cycle. The things that actually really help us from a marketing perspective is just telling stories, um, using the data that we have about all right, I'll give you an example. Um, we've just recently opened up a sales unit focused on grocery. And grocery is a tough business because it's super low margin and there's just a lot going on. And um, we've we've started to look at what is happening with the customer? How are they spending their money? Not what do they say they're going to do in a survey. How are they actually spending their money? Our grocery, you know, grocery is split into you've got discount, you've got um, the, the big guys, you've got the whole foods of the world, you've got, it's a really sort of complex space in itself. And then layer in things like meal kit delivery and layer in things like, um, restaurants. And when you can actually help a client understand, um, you know, we do white papers on things like this, but we also do it one on one with our clients, help them understand their space and how are customers thinking about spending their money, not just against, you know, Publix versus Kroger, but across the whole macro environment, it's really beautiful to be able to see trends of where a customer's going. Um, and I think our stickiness factor really comes from the fact that we can help marketers understand their own businesses and opportunities better. Um, and we do that on a repeatable basis. And it's just, it's really tough to get off of that once you start making decisions based on that kind of data. And you, when someone uh, engages you, they have to get the analytics, right? Because it, it's funny. Uh, it starts with what you know. We, it all uh, starts with that. We were working with one of our clients and noticed that uh, the analytics package was a module that they had to actually buy. And we noticed a big difference in customer satisfaction between those that had the analytics and those that don't. And so like you're self-defeating, you're shooting yourself in the foot if you don't deliver the analytics. So I thought that's, that's really interesting. Okay. So... Um, we got a bunch of CMOs listening. If we were going to summarize on approaching loyalty, do you have sort of two do's and a don't for them to think sure. about? All right. Let's see. Two do's and a don't. Do make sure that you are looking at as broad a picture as you can of how you're defining your loyal customers, right? Do make sure that – that's still the first one. Do make sure that you're like looking at the whole wallet view – um, and it's not just about purchase history, too. You want to have a better understanding of what drives them. Do make sure that you've got a broad enough lens to really understand what, how are you defining your loyals and where do you have headroom. I think that's the first one. Um, the second one, I think I actually heard um, some folks saying this yesterday at another Adweek panel, and I, I loved it. It's It's so simple, but do listen. Do listen to what your customers want. What are they doing? So our, you know, what we do is we sort of look at what have they done? It's very predictive. It is real. It's deterministic, but you also have to listen. You have to listen to be able to, to prepare your message, to prepare your creative, to prepare your story, to prepare your targeting based on what your customers actually want. Um, and then a don't, hmm. Let me think about a don't. Don't be scared to try something new. I think. Um, it's really hard to change inertia. And I, I fall into it myself as a CMO. I know what's worked, what hasn't. It takes some real um, inertia to try to move um, into something different. But don't be afri- afraid to try to be creative and to try something new. Um, you got to test it and go big later if, if it works. But inertia is a tough thing. And it's really easy to get sort of quagmired and doing the same old thing over and over. And it can really keep you from growing. 
I love it. And so it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, you, you know, you've heard me talk about Byron Sharps, how brands grow. Um, he's not a big advocate of loyalty. It's funny. He thinks that businesses grow based on acquisition. Um, I think there's lots of evidence that he's wrong. It's very circumstantial, but I really, uh, think that if you're not thinking about your customers and how you're improving loyalty uh, in them, you're probably not improving your product the way you should. You're probably not improving the service the way you should. You know, and I, and I think when we think about loyalty, what we're really talking about is how do we make the customer experience so amazing, right, that they actually want to, as uh, you know, to share it, to to be an advocate, to become this uh, opponent and, and proponent of your brand. That applies to employees too, right? When your experience is so great that your customers are saying amazing things about you, you feel better about the company. So there's all this ripple effect of thinking about loyalty, and and I I think that. You know, one of the interesting things that, that Danny has shared is that she's got a product that delivers on a fundamental level. So that's, that's basic, right? We got to do that. But then how do we elevate it? So thinking, think about loyalty as simply what else can we do to enhance our customer experience? And then marketing will follow. So, Danny, thank you so much for being on Renegade Thinkers Unite. Thank you. This has been great. I, I've really enjoyed it. And uh, to all the listeners there, your loyalty is appreciated. Um, and you can you can share the love. Uh, sharing is caring, as we say on this show. So be sure to, um, if you enjoyed this episode, um, you know, share it on your favorite social channel. Send it to a friend. Um, I always welcome your your feedback and comments, recommendations for guests. I, I love getting those emails from you. Drew at Renegade. Renegade.com. So until next time, keep those renegade thinking caps on and strong. This has been Renegade Thinkers Unite, but it doesn't end there. Just go to RenegadeThinkersUnite.com for more and subscribe to the show. That way you'll never miss an episode. We'll talk with you next time on Renegade Thinkers Unite.